Welcome back to Deep Thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. So I'm not sure what I want to call this thing. I've got a theme swimming in my brain, but it's sort of a several-pronged thing. And I think if I mix all three of them together, it's like it could technically be three different shows, but I think it would be a stretch for at least a couple of these subjects to take all the way to an, the end of an hour without just seeming like I'm pushing it. So here are the themes that are swimming in my head right now. One of them is the fundamental of um, like a tad bit of win. One of them is making life interesting for yourself. Taking whatever life you have, if you don't think it's interesting, and breaking out of that mold using techniques which are actually well documented on the show. The other theme is breaking free of your current constraints and your current paradigms of thinking that you've just absorbed over time that you need to change. You know, it's like if you stayed at a job too long and there's no promotion and you're not, you're not, you don't have to be totally discontent with the job, but it's just not challenging you anymore. And it could be that when you got there, it was challenging for a year or two and then you, know, you just became autopilot and you're kind of just looking around, you know, you got some money in the bank, you're good. And of course, last year and a half may have shattered any one of those dreams, depending on what kind of work you do. But still, it's there. And the third thing I'm thinking about, which is sort of completely off base initially in your brain from those first two, is this very simple question, which I think the other two could kind of feed it in a way, which is the question of we are trying to, if you're tired of the way the world's been run, we want to reset the world. Build it up from scratch. I mean, we really don't want to build it from scratch, but we definitely want to, like the hoarders, take everything outside and put everything back and you know, clean the place out and look at everything that's going to be brought back. Is this good? Is this bad? You know, and then bring it in. If you ask that question and you look at the world as a group, I think you have to be very, very concerned. We technically take, a, take the world back. We get rid of, like literally, we can push a button and everyone who has ever intentionally hurt other human beings habitually, not just a one-off mistake, but they make a practice of stepping on heads to get ahead. They just disappear. Where they go, who cares? And now the rest of us are here. Well, in order to hold together a planet, a society, there's all kinds of mechanisms, aren't there? From science to history to straight up Reading and writing and arithmetic, there's humanity at all different levels, spiritual humanity, functional humanity. Are we really ready to, at this intellectual mean of society globally, are we ready to rebuild the planet? Would those that are less informed be willing to surrender to those who are more informed? If you'd asked me this question in January of 2020, I would be so much more optimistic. But in May of 2021, I'm not that optimistic. I still have a very positive feeling about the process. But we just watched a bunch of idiocy. We're still watching a little bit of it. It's getting better as these individuals get caught lying about where things came from and who actually contributed to their creation, the bad science, et cetera, et cetera, they're starting to kind of say, okay, we need to back off this like as fast as humanly possible because the more you guys keep restrictions on people, the more they're asking questions, the more they're waking up, and we don't need any of that stuff, right? We work really hard to put these people to bed. So how do these things kind of come together in my mind? Those first ones, sort of breaking the mold of what you're doing to make your life interesting, can be the keystone to seeing the world in a completely different light as to what is important and what is not important. And that, I think, can feed very systemically an enlightenment phase of your life according to your desires 
that might lead to a better world that is going to be better prepared to actually rebuild it if we ever get a chance in an area. So let's go to the fun part. Because in the end, this will all be an insinuation towards that last one I mentioned. We don't necessarily need to make this anything negative whatsoever. Spicing up your life. Let's go for that. Because I think the counter the counterforce to spicing up your life and thus breaking free of your paradigms, it's all related. It is the circular ecosystem of the way you think, of the way you handle yourself. First thing I want to put forth is something I've said in several episodes, which is the following. If you're like me, doesn't matter how bright you are. Now, some people have exceptions to this rule, and I've met some of them, but there's even caveats with that. One could wake up early, earlier than another person to sort of weird stuff that's going on in the world, but they're not mature enough and don't have enough experience to deal with the emotional impact of it. And therefore, they can, honestly, you can get to a point where you feel like you're crazy, but <laughs> the inverse is true. You're becoming more sane and you're seeing the crazy. But the thing I want to mention is that we serendipitously grow up to be who we are until we wake up. I think a lot of that has to be the underlying force of what used to be the midlife crisis. You don't hear about that as much anymore because I think there's so many satiating short attention span methods to keep yourself busy that you can softly go through any type of midlife crisis you might be having. And again, it happens at different ages for different people. Vanity will speed up, in my opinion, a midlife crisis. The more that you're comfortable in your own skin, the less you are concerned about growing older, things changing, you know. It's, it's really interesting as a guy that you... I'm... I'm I don't know how women deal with this. Uh, Ladies, you'd have to let me know. But as a guy, you grow up, maybe as a teenager, and you're thinking girls, uh, like for me, I was always the girls that were older than me up to a certain point. And you start kind of looking ahead. Oh, that's who I want to date. That's who I want to date. And then eventually that age keeps going up because you don't want to be dating someone immature. And so whatever age that is for your intellect But at some point, you end up physically passing that age, and the people who are your age or older, they're already set in their ways, they're off the market. If you're still single, you're kind of looking around in your own age bracket, you're going, well, everyone's kind of weird at this bracket, right? And so, but your mind is saying, well, last time you had any success, it was at this particular age bracket, which in the past was ahead of you, and now it's below you, right? And it could be as simple as being 50, And it's people between 30 and 35, you know. So we grow up with inadvertent paradigms that we accept out of society. And now corporations are trying to take moral tax with us. Corporations are trying to pretend like they care about how you form as a human being. Oh, they care, all right, but they're not trying to help you succeed in life. They simply aren't. (laughs) The one that uh, protests so much is usually the company that's like, ExxonMobil, we care about the environment. <laughs> but within our own paradigm, me, I probably, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what I would define as being awake. Uh, not Don't worry about red pill stuff, but just understanding who I am as a person in a paradigm sense. It's a very advanced subject for a younger person. I took massive control over my life very, very early and set incredible goals and was very fortunate to in the right place with the right people and whatever, get that to work. That may not be true enlightenment. That's just being dedicated to your job or whatever, being lucky to work here, work there, whatever. That doesn't really mean I said, oh, who's that dude in the mirror? Oh, it's that guy. And instead of copying my heroes one way or the other, either symbolically or literally, I'm not going to just go, well, that dude's the one I actually am inside of. Let's make that dude cool with whatever that dude has available to us, especially your, your soul talking to your body. Oh, we're in this thing now. Oh, okay, cool. When you finally realize that you are your own individual and no one should be telling you, not in an 
overly defensive way, like a little kid, but just, you know, in general, you should be making the decisions about what you think is good, what you think is bad, what you think your life is all about. It's that moment. It's like that spark inside Frankenstein that you, you're alive finally, right? Before you weren't. And it's at that moment, you're either prepared for it or you're not prepared for it. I don't think most of us are prepared for it. What would being prepared for that moment look like? Well, it would be that you had this overwhelming feeling that something in your heart was differing with what you were doing in the outside world. However minute that might be, however massive that might be, you're like, I'm not aligned with what I'm doing. I, you know, I, I go to work, it's okay. It's like, I don't hate my, my colleagues or my employees or whatever. It's just something that's unfulfilled. And so when you wake up, a lot of times people will be like, I'm going to write that novel I've always wanted to write, or I'm going to do that triathlon, or I'm going to just go to Europe, or whatever that thing is. The earlier you wake up, I think the, the more success you, you can have in your life. I think the kicker is when you wake up and you're like, Ooh, where am I? Who am I? I have no idea. And then you have a midlife crisis. Because regardless if you're in the middle of your life, in terms of your whole longevity, you're, you feel kind of disoriented, but you still have all your stuff and you know all your friends and you're not waking up in the twilight zone being Arthur Curtis when you're really Jerry Reagan, you know. That's a little twilight zone reference for you. So the other one is breaking free, which would be, okay, I have had the first stage thing happen. Whatever degree you had it, if a scale of one to 10, you could have a 10, which is like, oh my God, I think a 10 would probably be you, you have this sense of yourself for the very first time. You know, you can, in a day, in a split second, you could say all these paradigms, see you later, man. I might come get some of you again, but right now, boom, I'm going back to the basic archetype of a human being, and I'm going to build the rest of this person. A 10 would be you have a plan and you woke up. A one would be you woke up, but you have no plan. And then so we just kind of put it in the middle. It has been my goal and my hope and my dream that some of these episodes have given you folks some tools to think about it, to think about what your goals are. And again, don't worry about anyone else's standards for your life. Uh, Big Herc got some negative feedback. He created a clothing line that says, don't settle for average. And people wanted to get offended, of course. And he, he only has a male audience. And so he had all these soy boys in there. What do you mean average? You know, you know, you know maybe we don't want to be like you. And it's like the dude just made another video. And he said, look, man, average is different for everybody. Being above average could just be simply pushing your kid higher than you are currently raising a family successfully. That's above average in this day and age, isn't it? The average bar is so low right now that you would have to be nearly incapacitated or dead in order to fail being above average. If your kid just studies in school and gets a normal grade, they're above average, right? Because the leave every child behind regiment here in the United States is just making sure every kid who couldn't pass when I was a kid gets pushed through with straight A's. But the, there's also a little principle I want to bring back because I was just having this conversation a couple of days ago. And it's when adults say the word, say the phrase, excuse me, doesn't time fly? Oh my God, just yesterday it was this. And man, just life goes by so fast. And the older you get, it seems like it goes faster and faster and faster. Now, I definitely have that sense a little bit what I have figured out is the following, and I think this is going to be a thousand percent true at whatever time psychologists actually figure this out on their own or watch one of these videos and go, oh, that's a pretty good idea. This is now the way. It goes something like this. When I was a kid, they did studies where they said, you know, uh, if you drove, well, they said they didn't really get to the cause of this. 
in its totality as it applies to time flying. But they said, you know, when you drive to work every single day, you will forget the drive. By the time you get to work, you've done it a thousand, ten thousand times, depending on how long you've worked at a particular location. And you won't remember. Someone asks you what you had for breakfast or lunch. You're like, you could be 25 years old with a mind as sharp as a nail, and you're still like, oh, yeah, what, what did I eat? You know, the reason why that happens is that it is useless information. Your brain wants to store the unique information, the exciting information, making your life exciting, supercharging your life. So the more that you engage in loops, the more your mind says, okay, all you needed to do was engage that loop correctly. Drive to work. Don't kill people in your car. Walk into the bathtub carefully because you haven't washed it in a few days and it's slippery. Don't fall down. Hurt yourself. But the bathroom ritual disappears every, every day, doesn't it? When do you have an exciting bathroom event besides a giant spider or, you know, the, the toilet backed up and pushed a bunch of stuff on the floor? Those are the days you remember because they're unique. Mm, you want time to slow down? What is the algorithm? The beautiful thing about algebra is that there's an equal sign in the center of the equation. Bunch of stuff on one side, bunch of stuff on the other side. Doing repetitive stuff makes time fly. So if you want to reverse that algorithm, stop doing repetitive stuff and time will slow down. Reason why I mention that is that that's sort of your, one of your benefit analysis is to doing some of this stuff. Because some of you might be like, well, some of you are happy with your life. Forget anything I'm saying. But you might, you know, for someone who's like 98% completely thrilled with every single day that they're alive on this planet, you could just be content. You want that, let's take that little 2% you got that's left in the dollar bill and let's spend it somewhere or save up the little two cents every single day until we go buy something, metaphorically speaking. You change your life in one little area. You bought that fishing pole. You were going to fish. The lake's right there. But you never did it for some weird reason. Grab a shelf of folding chair, your favorite beverage. Go to the tackle shop you've never been to. Buy yourself some stuff. Bring your fishing pole if you don't know what to do. I got to, what do I do with this thing? Oh, well, here's a bob and here's a string and here's a hook and here's some worms you can put on the end. Go for it. When this thing goes under the water, you need to yank on that pole. All right. Do you have to do something according to someone else's average, according to someone else's definition of success? Absolutely not. And that's the name of this game. This is to undo that association between even the examples I give you on this show, which is my life, my careers. Hey, man, if you have interest in that, do it. Again, the funny thing is I put the How to Write Movie episode up there. It's been watched like, I don't know, 230 times or something. And again, the joke is every time I tell someone to write films, not every time, but a lot of times, at least 50% of the time, someone just, oh, I got a movie for you. But, you know, you do all the work. I'll take all the money. So everybody wants to make a film, but no one wants to invest on how to do it. Hence, life, right? But they'll want to complain. Why doesn't Hollywood make any good movies? Why? Because it's stuck in your head and you won't learn how to get it out. <laughs> That's really the truth, man. A related topic to this whole thing, as it relates to the last point of, are we really educated to a level to rebuild the world in anything decent? I think we have a bunch of morons that can be absolutely duped by the sciences, you know, by peer pressure, by tribalism. People are more worried about being cast out of the tribe than they are about dying. There's a fireworks going off tonight. That's pathetic, in my opinion. <laughs> That's why I love Huntington Beach fireworks all year round. It's not too difficult to do something amazing according to you. Because all it has to be is something that you've never done before. When I teach kids how to draw, they sometimes, especially in schools today in America, there's no art classes. They got rid of all that because they understand that creates a more creative mind, thus a more discerning mind, thus a more think-for-yourself mind. And it also creates a journey 
that will empower the country as a whole. That's why I have a lot of respect for Russia, who apparently you learn all kinds of stuff over there before you graduate high school. Apparently driving is still optional at this point, but they're getting better. But I teach these kids, I've got this little method, teach them how to draw faces. I mean, I can teach any kid anything, draw bodies or whatever, but faces are the one that really intimidate people because all kinds of pieces and parts, and if you don't write them, draw them in the right sizes and, and proportions and distances, it'll look really strange, but even that's art. But once a kid follows my little thing, I draw a line, he draws a line, she draws a line, whatever, and they see what, that they drew something. And then I teach them how to change it. I teach, oh, you can make the hair like this, and you can do whatever you want. You make a wiggly line right here, however you want to make that wiggly line, and you can change the hairstyle. I teach them, you know, straighter eyebrows for boys, more curvy eyebrows for girls, curvier jaws for girls, straighter jaws for boys. And when they see it, they freak out. Because what that gives them is a frontier. Oh my God, I am actually an artist and I didn't know I was one. Now it's a silly analogy, but it would be a true analogy, which is what if everything you did in a particular day, you simply did every single thing different with the same outcome? Now it's silly because it would be like uh, you get in the shower at the end of the shower, like you got a bathtub that's a shower, right? And you always get on the end because if you get on the part with the faucet, you're going to get blasted in the head with the water and you don't do that. If it hasn't warmed up yet or it's too hot or whatever, you know, so you could go on the other side and your brain's going to go, what are we doing? This isn't the pattern. So all day you're going to think, oh, it was really stupid. I went in the shower the wrong way and I got splashed and it was too cold. It was too hot or whatever, but you'll remember it. Don't drive to work using the same streets. Have someone else drive you to work. I mean, just weird little changes like that. The way you, uh, have you ever just rearranged a room? And that Hawthorne effect where you're like, you just have this new, you rearrange your office and all of a sudden you feel like working more. It's weird. You rearrange your front room and you feel like sitting in it more. We're pattern-based beings. So make sure that if you're keeping a pattern, that you're just aware that that's going to get erased most of the time. We watch a bunch of funny videos in my lounge from time to time. And one of the little marathons that reminds me of humanity, especially as it relates to this conversation, are folks that will have found an injured animal when it's young, raise it in captivity, and then release it. And... There's all kinds of amateur versions of this, professional versions of this, from a duck to a bird to a hummingbird where the, the guy literally had the hummingbird in his house because he found it as a baby and got it totally, you know, nurtured up. And he didn't want to fly at first. And then eventually, on the first day, he takes it outside to release it. You know, the first flight, it flies away and then it flies right back. And he's like, uh-oh, I wonder if it's going to, never leave, you know? Nope. Next flight, boom, it's gone. Maybe he sees it again, maybe he doesn't, but usually they don't see him again. Now, hopefully they don't get eaten up by some other bird or some fox or something, but this happens for all wildlife. There's the funny one where the uh, they raise chimpanzees in captivity, and then they finally opened up this gate, and it was like a scene right out of 2001 A Space Odyssey, but the crowning achievement was to walk outside and exist in nature outside. And it took one person, one being to walk out that door and look around. And then they all kind of like two more and then all of them, boom. The, the way I interpret that is every being is programmed to want freedom, to control your own destiny. A friend of mine just posted a really cute post on Instagram. And it essentially said, it's been 20 years since I left my home as a young lady. And she goes, am I the only person that still has these wonderful moments where I'm super excited that I control my life? I can do anything I want. I can eat at any restaurant. I can stay in. I can go out. I can do whatever I want. And I think that that's beautiful 
because we do have those little feelings every once in a while. Now, what I would overlay on top of that exact frame of mind, and let me know if you have that feeling. I think it'd be interesting to know. If you're 67, you're going, man, I still have that feeling. You know, I think that'd be great. Now, we inherited a bunch of responsibilities as soon as we stepped out of our parents' captivity, of course. But I think about you have the freedom to invest in yourself however you want to invest in yourself, to invent a new career out of thin air. Sometimes you got to fight for it. Sometimes you don't have what it takes physically. There's some equipment you need or something to do something. You got to fight for it. And so there's something on the other side that's amazing. And it may be something that it just triggers something else. You know, you wanted to play the guitar, but you pick it up and it's, it's really difficult. But in messing around with the guitar, you figured out some software. And then you're like, ooh, this software is pretty cool. And you become like a sound engineer. I mean, like, you know, there's a bunch of weird little connections that can occur. Now, there is a transition I've also spoken about, which is, it's like a catch-22 that isn't really as much of a catch-22 as it feels. And this is for probably someone, I think, probably 40 and up. I don't think too many people under 40 have this particular feeling. But we form a bunch of goals when we're a teenager. Tons. Because we're sitting around doing nothing. Even if you are pursuing a lot of uh, hobbies to gain skills, right? But you will desire things that as you get older, you're like, oh man, I don't desire that anymore. And here's the catch-22. The catch-22 is that we don't imagine new things when we're older. So let's just say for the sake of argument, you had, uh, I think I told you guys, I wanted a bedroom because I was used to living in my parents' home with a bed, my dad, and then, you know, I have my desk and, well, you know, my little entertainment center with my stereo on it. So my desk and my computer and my art supplies and crap like that, like albums all around the whole room. And, of course, I wanted, like, a nice keyboard over here. And I wanted this. And I drew it. I drew, like, this the most amazing computer that I could think of in my mind, you know, and all this other crap in the room. And then eventually, as I got into my 20s, I looked around. I was like, oh, geez, I did it. Not even thinking about the drawing I did when I was like, I don't know, 14 years old, something like that. I actually drew, um, when I did my first video game solo, I drew this in a video game too. I converted my drawing into this thing. Anyway, but we just simply look back and we go, well, I didn't think of, uh, you did five things, you get them or you don't get them. It could be the kiss of death if you get them too. But you stop dreaming. I got kids, I got a spouse, and I'm done. You know, I just got to survive to the next day every single day. Well, there are definitely phases of your life where burden becomes thicker than other days. But your kids grow up. I mean, there's a point where you have to wipe their butt every time they go to the restroom. Even if they got diapers, you got to clean them up. And you're thinking, oh man, this is never going to stop. I smell poop every day and all that kind of stuff. But then... They get to an age in their teenage years, they're like, I got to go see my friend, bye. I'm going to see, bye, bye, bye. And now you're at home with all this time on your hands. It's unexpected because your kid doesn't come out with a manual with like a little warranty. It goes, okay, uh, your kid, this particular one's going to want to leave the house at 14. They're not going to leave the house till they're 18, but they're going to want to at 14. And this other one goes, this one's going to want to live with you until they're 45. You don't get that information, right? So it happens randomly. I have definitely known adults that, that made plans as soon as the kid goes to college, as soon as the kid hits a certain age, bam, they turn those things on and they start traveling, they start do woodworking or whatever it is, whatever their dream is, they do it. They take rooms that were allocated for kids to play in and they turn them into like man caves or, or family recreational rooms with the pool table and for the guys and something for the ladies and I've seen it. It breaks the pattern. It wakes you up. It, it imbues you every single morning with something wonderful that you did. I've, I've talked about this a little bit. I'm going to give you a funny little story happened. Uh, I guess it was this morning. I finally finished it up. I've always told you guys that, you know, aside from taking, well, I told you a long time ago, aside from taking my vitamins, uh, at least 2,000 milligrams of time-release vitamin C, my zinc copper, B17 from time to time. 
C is so powerful, I really keep B17 off to the side for the superpower. I use a, um, a Neil Med electric uh, water blower that I put in my nostrils, right? And it's what celebrities taught me. When they get sick, when they feel anything coming on, they start doing the, the pot through their nose, right? And you can get electric ones that are 30 bucks. And they're just amazing. There's no burning of the nose. It's wonderful. And my God, it will reset you. You can wake up with a fully stuffed up head, hit your nostrils, six seconds, six seconds, and then back to finish it out. Okay. So I got this thing. And I haven't used it in like a year because I felt really great all the way through this horrible thing that's been going around, right? I, I felt more healthy last year than I felt in a long time. But I don't get sick anymore because I take my C. Like no cold all the way through winter, nothing. But I wanted to use it. I had a little bit of a stuffed up left nostril. And I'm like, okay, so I'm gonna, let's just blow this thing. It feels really good today to do this. Otherwise, I feel fine. So I load it up with the salt water, the saline solution, and I plug it in. And I hit the button. I can hear the motor going inside, but it's not blowing any water through. And what I learned about this is saline solution is a salt-based solution in there, or whatever it is, the salt mixture they got in there. And it tends to corrode and harden. It actually clogs up your um, garbage disposal. So don't use it in the drain that your garbage disposal. Use it in the other drain and then run hot water for about 10 seconds, fully hot water, not just not just 10 seconds, but hot water to blow all that stuff out of your pipes because it will eat your metal pipes. I had to actually redo my pipes under my uh, sink once. But I'm in this mode of my life. The reason why I'm telling you the story is I'm in this mode of my life where it's like, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix everything. This computer I'm using, for those of you that have been around for a long time, uh, I blew out the, I tried to fix the power supply and then I blew out this chip in the computer that protects it against power surges. But I mean, it fried it hardcore and my computer was dead. My fastest computer I had at the time. So I was like, oh crap. So I don't have 2,600 bucks floating around. So I flipped it over, opened it up, ended up buying a part for $1.60. Soldered it in, boom, computer's been working perfect ever since. And it's probably a crappy solder job. So I fixed that. Feels better than going to buy a new computer. That thing, I took it apart. And I was like, I couldn't figure out how to get it apart. So it took me like three days because it was getting frustrating. So what I did was I took it apart, got to a point and was like, oh, okay, I'm going to go to bed. This is, this is too late. And the next day I got up to a certain level, put it all back together, turned it on. The motor's going, still nothing coming through the pipe. I'm like, son of a... And it turned out there was just this little bladder in there that oscillates back and forth and it's create, creating the suction. And I realized that there was a weird part where I didn't realize how these two screws worked. And I realized I put this part on backwards. The screws weren't flush and I didn't screw it in enough to create a full vacuum in this little chamber, had a little tiny seal across the top. that was like a micron of exposure to the outside air. And this time before putting it back together, I put the whole inside unit together, stuck it in the water, pumped it. Boom. Here comes the, uh, the fluid. And then I was like, great good put it all back together boom blew my nostrils out and it was like it's a measly 30 bucks i saved buying a brand new one insides that were absolutely perfect pristine and so i was like this thing's not gonna break in a really long time there's almost no parts to the whole thing and everything looks brand new inside save myself 30 bucks and i was like i had this satisfaction that i did something different and i was telling a close friend of mine but I did this and she was like, well, what is it in your brain that makes you want to do that? <laughs> you know, why don't you just throw it away and get a brand new one? And it was all the above, man. It was just feeling like I can use my brain in ways that I never have before. Because I have been just the guy to say, eh, whatever. If lighter doesn't work, throw it away. That cutter I fixed the other day for the cigars. Completely different technology. Just need to be taken apart, oiled up, put back together. Click. I got this beautiful cutter now. Think about that example in your own life. You don't have to be a fixer necessarily to achieve this feeling. It's just, you know, you used to hire a landscaper to come and plant flowers, but you like, you just thought, man, how hard could it be, man? I'm going to go to 
whatever gardening place you want to go, you get a bunch of crap. In fact, if you don't even know what to get, just ask them, just like, I got this place in my, take a picture with your phone and just say, this is the spot in my front of my house. Which, what works right there? I need to spread out over time. What do I, what do I need to do there? They'll hook you up. They sell stuff, right? Well, how do I plant it? What, what do I do? You know, do I, do I need to buy soil from you? You know, my soil's really dry. What, I got this thing in my front yard. Used to have um, honeysickles all over the front of my, this one area when you enter my house. And these very unprofessional landscapist guys I was hiring at the time cut it down with a weed whacker, said it was growing back. It didn't, of course. It's not a rose bush, man. I'm going to have to do that. I'm going to have to be a dude, do what I used to do for my grandmother plant flowers and plant whatever the hell I want up front there. It's not what I thought I was going to do, but cheaper. Plus I get to decide how it gets put together and maybe I'm good at it. Don't know. But the theme of breaking free of the world that grew up around you, the world that was shoved down your throat, shoved into your head. Again, just remember I pet goat for those of you who watched that cartoon on YouTube I did a whole episode on it. You want a review of it from my perspective. But there's a there's a character with like an egghead and it's cracked open and it's got a TV jacked into this kid's head. And they're telling you how they're controlling you. It's right in your face, man. So you unplug all that crap and throw it away. And I tell you, after November 6th last year, I turned off all the news. Because I was like, it's all disinformation. I don't want anything to do with it. And now it's weird. I live this amazing life with my friends, with human beings. I handle my stuff professionally. Clears your mind too, right? It's just not negative anymore. Even my lounge, we've backed off huge. We're watching funny stuff mostly or movies or whatever. And... When I, uh, every once in a while, I'm like, I'm just morbidly curious. What is this news organization saying? I got one or two left over and I just click in and I just look at it. I'm like, wow, this is the most acidic frequency ever imaginable. And if you itemize the articles that are trying to doctrinate you, that's almost every single one of them. They're trying to get me to care about the royal family of England. This fake thing between, you know, the, the brothers and our getting along. Dude, that is them trying to convince you to accept the monarchy because the United States is the only one that didn't accept them. They're dramatizing this, right? Remember Apollo 13, the whole thing is a nobody wanted to see the moon missions anymore? After 11 and 12, they called up the, radio, the television stations and said, I love Lucy's not on the air. Get this crap off the air. And so NASA figured, oh God, we're not done money laundering this scam so they created Apollo 13. This explosion that only has one paragraph in the investigation with really no conclusion about what could have exploded on the outside of the lunar module or the uh, service module. It's all a hoax. So they're taking the playbook out of that and putting it on the royal family and throwing it in your face. So if you want to break free, you're going to have to shut that crap off. And what's amazing is you hear that little cricket over there, a few crickets making crickety noises, it's sort of soothing, you know? I wish we had the uh, cicada for my hometown. They were amazing. I couldn't do this show at night in my hometown. It'd be too loud between the frogs and the cicada, which for whatever reason my hometown calls locusts. And just a little side note, uh, they tell you that cicada only come out like once every 17 years. I don't know where that person lives, but they sure as hell don't live in the Midwest of America because they come out every single year it's actually something i love dearly and i loved it when i lived there but it gets loud I mean, it gets so loud when they get going man there's like a million of them without exaggeration on a block all in unison it's crazy it's amazing but that's what life can sound like once you shut off all the crap and then guess what happens you ever try to think and someone is making noise? Uh, a fan is blowing, the car is making a loud noise, and you lose your train of thought because it's just so overwhelmed your mind with electricity that you can't maintain the complex sacred geometry of your thought. It happens to me all the time when I'm on the show here. That firework went off. It totally made me forget what I was going to say exactly. And I love it. 
But once you shut off the outside noise, then guess what you hear for the very first time? Your own thoughts. And the most clarified, beautiful, polished, clear glass method that you've ever heard your own thoughts. And it's huge when you're like, oh my God, I'm, I'm actually pretty good about thinking cool stuff. And then you start remembering your old dreams and you'll have a laugh or two at the things like I just said, you know, I mean, I got the dream that I wanted, I guess, out of that drawing I had as a little kid. But your priorities as a little kid are little kid priorities. Maybe some of them are healthy for you and maybe some of them are just silly because they're just not important. Make new ones, no matter what age you are. Make them within your constraints. But also, question any of those constraints that you think you might have. And I know that's easier said than done, but trust me, you know, you have people that, people who've lost a lot of weight and gotten uh, in shape. Whatever their definition of that is, don't worry about someone else's definition of being in shape. But they look at their big body and they're like, man, I've been this way my whole life. And there's no way I could break this. I mean, I'm just this way. I've just accepted it, right? And then one day you get tired of it. One day you get tired of, you know, your thighs touching, not being able to see anything below your waist or whatever it is. And you just go, you know, I'm, I'm actually pretty bored of the food I'm eating too. So let's just eat to stay full. Let's get healthier stuff. I mean, when I was a kid, I swear to God, growing up in Kansas, we had, you know, a lot of organic food and stuff. But then I grew up in Massachusetts for a little while. You didn't go to the grocery store and necessarily think about eating healthy. It was just eat, you know, and, and cereals that were full of sugar. That was a funny thing that my father would like not get me certain, like he wouldn't get me Fruity Pebbles because it was a tiny box and man, those things are delicious, man. And I just consumed the box. He would too. He was overweight his whole life and now he's more of a weight than anyone in the whole family. But he even had a point where he got, uh, started dating a woman who was super in shape and he went down to like 175, 180 pounds. The dude's 6'3", man. He was straight out of, you know, the military at that point. So there's always a technique. It's just maybe the method that someone else uses is not your method. Who cares? That's another set of indoctrination. Well, there's this diet you can do. Whatever, whatever. It really just comes down to eating a little less of the crap and a little bit more of the good stuff. So my point about the past not really thinking in a healthy manner is that today... It's all over the place, right? You go to a grocery store and there's the organic stuff. And there's the crap you've been eating for the last hundred years. There's the organic stuff. I mean, I guess I shouldn't say hundred years, but at least the last 30 years, right? And they snuck GMO in underneath the radar. And sugar has just been getting more popular since probably the 60s. But fat and grease and really uh, fatty meats or whatever... You don't have to eat that stuff, you know. But here's the big benefit of any tiny little change you can make in your mind. And I'll tell you what, there's two successes to this. One is immediate with almost no progress in the outside world. And there's one that's the outside world progress. The first super duper paycheck you can collect on yourself is just having the decision to change something about what you're doing. And it doesn't have to have a negative to make a positive, right? A lot of New Year's resolutions uh, are sort of a joke, right? People start the chatter around December 25th. What do you, what's going to be your New Year's resolution? What's the archetype of a New Year's resolution? Something bad you were doing or something you were neglecting and you're going to get back into it like you used to be or you're going to make that big change. The problem is, is that's being catalyzed by a temporary conversation that is denoted by the turn of the, the Christian calendar. As soon as the chatter ends at the end of like what, January 15th, then you no longer have some external fuel to put in your rockets to do what you thought you were going to do. Once you make the decision for yourself and say, uh, I don't know, April 13th or whatever it is, it's your decision. No one else's decision. Another little trick I can tell you is don't tell anybody in the whole world that you're making this change. 
Keep it a fun secret. Let them notice whatever that change is. I mean, if you're going to do something big and you got a spouse, you probably should uh, figure out a way to create a, either a, tell them the truth or, or make it a fun surprise for them. Most things aren't like that. You deciding that you're going to take charge of your life is usually the first beautiful feeling. The next day you wake up, nothing has occurred yet except up here. The most impossible place to control is your mind because you can do something in the world just because you, oh, I'm going to walk over there. Well, that's pretty easy, right? Now change your mind about how you think about chocolate, how you think about designer beers, liquor, porn, whatever it is. Oh, that's a little tougher, right? Why? Because it's had a huge habitual trigger in your mind, a dopamine association in your head. But once you start doing what Tony Robbins says, which is always attach positive to only the things that have positive results in your life, attach negativity to the things that negatively have impacts to your life. And then the brain will do it automatically. It will start changing your life automatically. Your addictions will change. You'll be addicted to lifting a weight versus putting a pie in your mouth. I have a pie in my uh, refrigerator right now. But I also lifted weights today, so I feel better. The other more kind of higher-end cerebral application of this whole theme is the third point I made at the beginning. If, let's just say, I'm trying to make sure this is uh, useful for most of the listeners. Pick a leader that you like that you think could change the world and make it a better place. And that leader is either in power at the time where you were having this facetious example, or they're going to be in power in the future. You believe so. Or they're just kind of a, I don't know, some affecting influencer in the world, and they have a private meeting with you. You're living this normal life. And they come up to you and they say, can I talk to you for a second? And you're like, absolutely. I'm a huge fan of yours. And you say, okay, here's the thing. We're going to be resetting the world. It's going to be great. I'm going to need you personally to take on a membership in one of the areas where we're going to need a lot of change. Education, um, the arts, whatever. We're going to need good music to come out of the radio for the first time. It's not going to have... You know, Miley Cyrus's saint worshiping stuff in it, right? Of which she admitted to a friend of mine. Actually, she said it to a nine year old girl who said, I want to be just like you. What do I have to do? And Miley bent down to her and said, You're going to have to worship Satan. And then she turned around and her father's just going, What? Her neighbor. True story. So this person, this leader of yours, is asking you to get on board. And all of a sudden, because of the quest, because of that suggestion, excuse me, and the question of whether or not you'll help him, you're, you're loaded. Your brain's just like, oh my God, I'm somebody because this other person told me I was valuable. And they're deciding this area of the world that they believe that I can make a huge contribution to. Nothing wrong with this whole scenario, right? But just remember, you don't need them. Technically speaking, you don't need them to tell you any of this stuff. You just need to find out where you would do it if they didn't exist. Or you look at society as a whole in your local community. Don't worry about India and Russia and China, all those places. You're just going to make your world better. By example, people will emulate you the more you help them. I, uh, I planted a seed. We'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll see what happens. I've told you guys this a long time ago, which is um, I made a, well, I, I found my neighbor gave his kid a skate ramp. It was ugly as hell. I brought it over here on this patio right here, and I worked about a month making it look cool. Painted this huge Aztec thing on it, which is all skateboard symbolism on it and stuff, because the kid's half Irish and half Mexican. Put all these logos on it. It was cool. The day that he was across the street that I was going to roll this thing out, I, uh, I brought him back. He's nine years old at the time. I brought him back and I said, uh, here's the deal. You're, how old are you? He said, nine years old. I said, okay. I forgot how old I was at the time. I told him how old I was. I said, do me a favor. I said, when you're my age, find a kid your age 
and do this for them. However you can do it, right? Whether it's art or something else. And he just looked at me and he was like, last thing he ever thought I was going to say, right? And he goes, okay. And he's got a family that's just made of gold bars. So he's, he's likely to remember that and maybe pay it forward at some point in time. I didn't have to do that. Jesus, I probably spent 150 bucks on paint. And definitely for my, uh, my hourly rate, that, that ramp is probably worth about 20 grand. You know, They rode that thing until they destroyed it. It's gone. It's totally gone. They don't skateboard out front much anymore, which is kind of sad, but they grew up, you know. It was asymmetrical to my behavior, meaning I had never done that before. Uh, I remember watching them skate, and I, I just had the idea, and I, I approached him, and I, he's like nine years old, right? And so I said, here's what I'm going to do. He could barely understand the words coming out of my mouth in full context, but I said, I want to paint this. Is that okay? And he says, yeah, man, it'd be great, because it was ugly. I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make you one of my clients. He's like, oh, okay. So I'm going to draw a bunch of ideas you pick. And uh, whatever you pick, is that, that's what we're going to do. And so I must have sat out front drawing for, I don't know, two weeks. Just nice summer, smoking a cigar. I'm just drawing and watching them do their thing, having a bunch of different ideas. And then we, we executed. That was the most fun I ever had, being in this back patio. It was 2014, yeah. So you can make weird asymmetrical changes to your life like that. And hey, you know, maybe the archetype has some interesting elements to it, such as maybe right off the bat, you're not doing anything for you except doing something for someone else. And then, you know, doing things for other people, uh, what I find is as I donate my time to various folks, I will find that what I want to do with my life starts to bubble to the top because of neglect. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, this is one thing I want to do. So when I finish the next gig, I'm not going to volunteer any new stuff. I'm going to start doing my thing. I get my thing done. And now I'm lusting for giving something to someone else. So it just keeps going back and forth, back and forth. I'm paying my um, sort of respect for life forward because I've been very fortunate. So I'm pushing things forward. And in the end, I get to find out what's, what's important to me. The other one that I don't talk about enough is sometimes what you really need is to just sit and meditate and chill. Especially if you consider yourself fairly existential, you may need to sort out your thoughts. You might need to figure out where do you think you are in the universe? What do you think the purpose of this place is in the universe? Yeah, I've done it. I've done it involuntarily at times. And I will suggest if you want, this is a great one. Get one of those little tiny black books that are like, in any color you want, but it's just a tinier picture. It's a book with just blank pages in it, right? Get your favorite writing utensil. I would suggest not a pencil because it will rub off over time. Get your favorite ballpoint pen. Find your little utopia, whether it be in your front room, back patio, the beach, out in the middle of the wilderness, wherever the hell it is, and just think. Because if the more that you wake up and you don't have the new dreams for your current timetable, that's a great complimentary thing. I guarantee you for the folks that smoke cigars, it's not, well, there's hardly a better time to sit and smoke a stogie. I've done it for hours and hours and hours on this back patio, just sitting, chilling, getting some sun, get my vitamin D. I just have the pen and paper. In fact, I'm really due for that right now in my life, to be honest. And, and I'll, yeah, I'll pick an area of science, like the whole infinity project I'm working on. It's, uh, it's still percolating. I did this in the fireside chat to the uh, Patreons and even just talking it out in the fireside chat with the Patreons. I, I, uh, it's just me talking. I don't want to mislead anybody. Everyone's all over the world. So it's a little tough to bring everyone in, but you sit and design something, design a UFO, have fun, you know, just go, you know, if I was tasked to do a UFO, I don't know how this would actually work, but you know, this is probably what I have to do. I mean, just have fun. But the other thing, you know how they tell you, 
get a piece of paper. And I just watched this woman give some advice to folks. She's really a sweetheart. I just kind of connected with her on Facebook because she knows some friends of mine. And I looked in and she's like an inspirational kind of video maker. Not a huge following or anything, but she said, you know, get, put 50 things down on a piece of paper, which is a super high number. I don't even know if I could come up with 50. 50 things you want to do in your life or 50 things that are important in your life and then start crossing them off and evaluating them. And I, I was like, 50, that's a lot. I'd say 10, you know, 10's a lot. But the, here's one thing I don't hear people tell folks to do. And I think we do it involuntarily in our brain, but this is you assessing who you are as a human being, which is the old saying, if you don't know where you're going, you can't, you can't, if you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you're going sort of thing, right? Write down, maybe, if this is a, if this is a help to you, some of the greatest things that ever happened to you in your life. Maybe there's two columns, things you did with other people and things you did all by yourself. Depending on your access to other people, maybe that's not the most important side of the list. Maybe it's like, this one's for me. I already have beautiful kids and a good husband or wife or whatever it is, and I'm just going to write things that happened to me. When I treated myself in a particular way, I felt better. you know. And then that can tell you sort of what makes you tick, what turns you on. And the thing is, is you probably won't write some of those things down if they no longer matter to you anymore. But as you do write them down, I'll give you one. That won't, it, you write it on paper one way, but the, what it means to you is a completely different thing. And this is what I do when I do like, you know, life management with people. Someone says, well, the, the day I got my first car. And so you might interpret that literally and go, I just need to get a new car. Hmm. That's not what it was that made you happy. It was freedom, baby. It was control. You can now get in a car and go wherever the gas tank will take you. That's freedom. So that's what it means to you is that you had this freedom. Now you're like, well, well I already have a car now. I can drive wherever I want to go. I have that freedom now. Hmm. Well, then you need to cross-reference it with other things in your life. Yes, you have a car. Yes, you can go where you want to go. So literally speaking, the mechanism of that vehicle is still in, in your grasp. But now you need to ask yourself, in my opinion, do you feel as free as you used to feel? Now, let's say you have some kids. And you're like, well, not really, but, you know, I love my kids. They're really fun. Or maybe they're being a pain in the butt this particular month. Then you start going, okay, well, they're not going to be here my entire lifetime. They're going to eventually grow up and go to college or get their own thing. So now you say to yourself, all right, what would you do if life was a little bit different? You're, you're rich and you got a nanny, they give you some hours off in the middle of the day or whatever. What would you do if you had that freedom back? Then you write that down. And it's not for now. Some of it may not be for now. Some of it might be, but it's when they do leave. You go back to that little black book and you go, oh, all right. Now we're going to do this one thing that was a little bit difficult when my kids needed me every single minute of every day. And they get 16, they go hang out with their friends half the time. And you can pull that list out and start going for some of that stuff. I will tell you, YouTube for me is, uh, like I've said several times, can be a obviously a negative thing. But it can be a massively positive thing when it comes to getting educated about the things that you're curious about. I have found that as I've got into like fixing things, right? Uh, obviously, I mean, I replaced the things I have found on the internet, okay, that I was able to do things that I never thought I would be able to do, at least as quickly as I did it. I replaced a, um, a power steering motor on my old car. I found a, a forum some dude had taken pictures and showed how you do it. And so when I had to replace this motor, it was like I had to take off, you know, a bunch of molding underneath my steering wheel. I got up in there and I'm like, I can't believe I'm taking this motor out of my car. I've never done anything like this before. And because it's just a part of the car. Engine, a lot easier because it's like, okay, you do this and that. But this is like messing up the steering column. 
I had that thing finished in 15 minutes and I was going as slow as I possibly could, taking photographs of every single aspect of the repair. And by the time I was done, other than the motor, which only cost me $89, the repair was going to be 600 bucks. This is a Chevy. Okay. Give me a break. By the time I was done with that repair, I put the tie, the little zip tie, back on the motor to the point where if I took it back to the dealership at a future time to have them do it, they wouldn't be able to tell whether or not it was original or if it was me having put it in there. That's the power of the internet. And I, I will tell you, anyone who can hear my voice, because you've had the IQ to find this video and push play, you have way more IQ than you need to replace that motor. Guarantee it. The only thing that would make you mess up is fear. That's it. And I had plenty of that while I was doing it, and I made it through it. One of the most powerful things that happened to me last year was doing the intro to this show for a bunch of different reasons. And I think the archetype of this share with you is going to potentially give you an example of where you can do things in your life that will surprise you. Now, forget about the exact thing that I'm going to be talking about, which is me learning 3D rendering, animation and stuff. Now, I knew a lot of this stuff in theory, like the back of my hand, but I hadn't used this tool before and I'd never done that level of production, any tool in my life, right? So first things first, I make a decision in March of last year to do this project. I'm sitting in the lounge and I said, ah, you know, I'm just going to model that room. I'm going to model the pod. I'm going to model everything, right? Having no idea how long it was going to take. I had no idea it was going to take me eight months to do it, right? So I've been using Blender 3D for, again, two years before that. But I mean, I was using it like crayons. I was not doing anything challenging and I was struggling through everything. So 2020 hits and I'm realizing, man, it's not going to be any work for quite a while. Definitely not any script work unless I write my own stuff, which I did, but no one was hiring me, of course. And uh, so I jump into this thing. I buy some classes on blendermarket.com probably two three hundred bucks worth of classes they changed my life but i could have i didn't know but i could have gotten a lot of that out of youtube it was nice just to not have to search for it right i had it so i'm watching these classes i only got through probably 80 percent of any one of the classes i haven't finished one class yet but i learned what i need to learn i'm a grouper i don't i'm not a stringer i don't need to finish the class i don't feel guilty at night when i go to bed having gotten exactly what I wanted. So one, I do all this stuff that blows my own mind. I'm like, I can't even believe I was able to do this, right? So that's one thing. I started the year with no knowledge at this level. At the end, it was like, I could have made everything unbelievably photo real with all kinds of wild camera shots, but I was running out of time for you guys. So at some point I had to send it to the render farm. I would totally redo it now, but I don't want to put a thousand bucks into rendering again. 500 of my own time, 500 of like render farm time. But here's the other thing that happened that was probably more profound to me. When I got done and I would show my buddies, you know, hey, you know, this is the show. And because people are like, I don't know if I want to watch a YouTube show. And I'm like, well, here, you know, check this out. When they see that intro, both kind of younger people, but definitely the older people who are exactly my age, they'll usually say something like, oh my gosh, you did all that? How do you do that? I can't even think about doing anything like that. Mm -hmm. They just revealed a paradigm worship that they can't do something. That's why Dick Gregory yells at you when you say, don't say you can't do anything. Never utter those words because that is you programming your insides. And even if you're looking at something you wouldn't have any interest in doing, like making a 3D animation for the front of a YouTube show, your brain doesn't care about the subject matter you're saying I can't to. It's just hearing you can't. And there's all kinds of funny phrases they made in the 70s, 80s at school. I can. What was it? Was it wasn't that the the I can movement of like the 80s, something like that? I don't know if it was Nancy Reagan or whatever. She was don't do drugs, right? Okay. So you could turn something down because you're not interested in it. That's fair game, man. Why the hell would you do something you're not interested in? But don't say you can't do it. 
You know what I mean? Yeah. Again, I'll never be a linebacker in, in the NFL uh, just because of physical constraints, of course. But I also don't have any interest in being that. But using your mind, ah, you can always use your mind. You can do all kinds of stuff. So believe in the ball and throw yourself is what I'm trying to say. We want a better world, right? We really do want a better world. And, you know, there's that old saying about the revolution of the United States when we fought Great Britain. I guess we're not Great Britain, it's the British uh, Army. They said only 4 four to 5 percent of this continent actually engaged in the fights. And they saved it for everybody else, the other 96 percent. So a lot of times I will, I will hear that actually quoted back to me with someone who's sort of being lazy with their responsibility to their own world. And they're like, well, you know, I don't have to do it because, you know, it's only 4% or whatever. Didn't the revolution and they're trying to get away with kind of copping out. You're not watching this show if you're not in the 4%. You know, you are the 4%, but it's much bigger than 4% today, isn't it? We don't know how many people are awake, red-pilled. I think 2020 showed us a depressingly low average. But we don't know what people are thinking. We don't know if they're... Uh, I mean, I started out not going any place that, that wouldn't let me go in without the breathing constraint on my face. And after a while, I was like, you know what? I got to go into two places in the entire world. They're going to force me to do that. So I get in and out. I'm out in five minutes. That's including cashing out the card and getting out of there. Because I just, you know, it's like, this hasn't been deemed as a law yet. That's when I would fight. So it's like, all right, so... These poor kids that are working at these places, they don't need to have me coming as an old man, making them feel bad. Now, the kid that told me to go fuck myself at, uh, it was a round table pizza. When I was being very kind, I wasn't even saying anything personal. I was saying something obtuse about how ridiculous this was. No one was in the entire building except for he and I. And I was like 20 feet away from the guy. So that guy, he gets an F plus, but everyone else, they're just dealing with life, you know. But we, we are so conditioned to hire out our lives, aren't we? You know, again, like coming from the Midwest, you changed your own oil. In fact, my family, my God, we mounted our own tires. We balanced them with our own weights on and we repaired our own engines. You want to do some body work? My neighbor right here does the most amazing body work on his own vehicles. Makes them look cherry. Unbelievable. If you guys have a classic car that needs to be redone, you're in America. I got a neighbor who'll take care of you. He got an old, he has a car uh, that's been in movies. It's an old, gosh, I, I don't want to try to quote the year, but it's it's old as hell. And it it's unbelievable. 18 layers of lacquer on it. It's just inside and out. It's just the most perfect car. He's, again, put it in movies. And I thought he bought the car that way. And it turns out he bought a Christine and he took it to the auto repair school he was going to when he was much younger. And he used it as the guinea pig in the, in the, uh, in the class. And now it looks like it never was ever damaged. And he's doing a new one out front. He's got a guy that brings cars. If you guys go on my Instagram, you'll see some of the vehicles he's been working on. Unbelievable. That dude never, ever, ever says I can't about anything. So just say, it's not interesting to me. It's not my goal right now. I could if I wanted to. I could write a movie, Mr. Deep Thoughts Guy, but I don't want to. Not a priority in my life. And that's a damn good answer. If you're raising kids, it's super duper important to imbue this kind of information on them. Don't let them say they can't. They don't have to do, I mean, again, they, they could say I don't want to. That's a different argument altogether, right? Let them use all of their years before they're 18 years old to figure out their skill sets. One of the things we've been watching on TV, which is sort of a warning to at least American kids, is I'm fascinated with um, competitions with robots. And I don't know if you guys have seen this, but there's uh, something called the Mouse Robot Challenge. And it is, uh, there's all kinds of different challenges. Sometimes they have a big room with a big black 
surface and they put those white tape on the um, on the ground and it's all in this real wild maze formation and the, the vehicle has to do two runs. First time it's learning the track. It's kind of going slow, but it's getting confused sometimes. It does spin outs and stuff like that because the program isn't great. But if it makes it to the final destination, they time it. And then the second run, it's learned the track. It's memorized the track. So every time it's a straightaway, it hauls ass, man. It's just, boom, turns the corner, goes really fast. And sometimes it can go so fast, it blows out the turn. The other one is a maze where it's actually got walls, and it's figuring out how to get to the center chamber. Then the kid wins, and they time it again. Run it a second time, goes faster. And here's the interesting thing. Almost categorically, 98% of the kids who show up, even in America, are from China, Taiwan, Japan. Almost no American-born kids. I don't care. Pick any race in America you want. doesn't matter. White kid, Mexican kid, doesn't matter. They're all flown in from other countries. They're flying in to win these contests and get these trophies. And they're mastering robotics, man. And I'm just sitting there. I was sitting there tonight. And I said, man, you know, American kids better get with it. I don't know what European kids are doing. Now, there are kids in every country that know how to do this, but they're sure as hell not showing up to the competitions. But the one I watched tonight was narrated in English. Americans all around this room, but no American walked up and put a car down. They had a Sikh guy, uh, older guy. He, he blew it out. He did a great car. So it's interesting. There's so much that the world needs from every single one of us and you have something to give and you know you do it's probably not even a surprise it's probably none of you sitting there going i can't think of anything yeah, you got things on your list things you're good at and again a bunch of you are already doing those things you don't really need to add anything to your list if that's the case and you listen to an episode like this just pat yourself on the back you're on the right track you know but we slip we get, we get bored we get tired we get lazy every once in a while hey man don't ever worry about punishing yourself or anything. Just get on track. That's all. You know, it, and I said this the other day. I was talking about mentoring my employees. And it's real. Uh, I managed to listen to that one again. And I thought, oh, yeah, I need to make a finer point on that. Which is, how many times when you were young, you screwed something up and an adult walked up and said, oh, boy, that's a mess. And you think that the next thing's going to happen because you're a kid, there's going to be punishment, ridicule, something to make you feel stupid. But they don't do it. They go, okay. Well, you want to do this? Oh, that's cool. All right, well, give me that over there. Let's clean this up. <laughs> give me the quicker picker upper right there. And then let's, let's do this, right? And then they help you and you get it done. And you even see the adult go, oh, wow, that is really hard. How'd you even get it this far, you know? And then together you work it all the way out and both of you at the end of the exercise know how to do it pretty much perfect the next time. That's the way we need to treat each other. This idea that um, it was a funny epiphany I had, one of the constraints that I had was, uh, I mean, I, did, I didn't technically get in trouble a lot when I was a kid because I didn't get caught most of the time, but I definitely got my ass whipped a couple times and and so I definitely got punished. And, but you get this paradigm in your brain about the punishment thing, right? And I sort of think that people who engage in punishment outside of a child paradigm, okay, because you definitely need to make sure your kid doesn't do it anymore. You know, my dad usually beat my butt when I was doing something that was life-threatening to me. And so he didn't want to lose his son. So he's like, I'm going to spank this right out of you, man. You need to think about when you're out wandering in the woods by yourself and you're four years old. And you're jumping across streams that are deeper than you're tall. I'm gonna spank your butt because you don't wander away from the home, right? So that's that's one of those things. But anyway, as you get older, this punish paradigm doesn't just turn off in your head. You're late for work. Well, there's a punishment. Really. You get fired, right? So there's certain thresholds there. But you, one thing I realized, I think I was in my 30s, late 30s, early 40s, and my girlfriend at the time was sort of in this, it's natural. I'm not blaming her, man. I probably did it myself, you know, involuntarily, passively, without even thinking about it. But it was sort of, you did something wrong, there's a punishment phase, right? 
Uh, you could pout. You, but the pouting is not even uh, as on point as I'm talking about, but you just read them the right act or you reiterate the mistakes so that you make them feel bad. Partly, maybe you're trying to stop their behavior. But there was just a point when I realized that if I had done something wrong, that I was definitely not trying to hurt her feelings. Uh, you know, I mean, when do you wake up in the morning? I'm going to hurt my spouse's feelings. I'm going to hurt my girlfriend, boyfriend's feelings. I don't think anybody wakes up like that. If you're mentally sane, which is probably 99.999% of us all, right? But one time I just had to stop her and I said, look, I'm not going to walk around feeling like I'm in trouble anymore with you. So let's not make each other do that. I won't do it to you. Don't do it to me. If we did something wrong, let's just communicate that we screwed up. And then uh, we'll just work, work it out. But one of the things I found out on that note that really works early in a relationship is just being honest and saying, okay, here's the deal. I am way, way away from being perfect. So if I do something that's gonna, that rubs you wrong, even the slightest thing is rubbing you wrong, don't let, it, don't let it get to the point where I'm really doing it super badly. Go ahead and communicate. You know that thing you did? It's just one of those things. That's all you gotta say. You don't have to say, well, I really wish you wouldn't do that and did it. You know, if there's an alternative that's better, definitely mention that. But it's like, remember that conversation we had? Well, that's one of those things. And uh, what I do is this. And so you know, the closer we get to that, I'd feel more comfortable. And then all of a sudden, you have a, a new paradigm in a relationship where you can communicate with each other a hell of a lot better. The one that you'll see on the net that's that's part of humanity and us getting along with each other, it blows my mind. I mentioned this a couple times, but it's the thing where someone, like an old lady um, who's probably shouldn't be driving, or old guy, old guys do it even worse, they'll drive their car into a convenience store or <laughs> pull away from the gas station and yank the whole tube off the thing and, you know, it's it's horrible. Isn't it weird how those, the gas thing in the tube connected to the freaking pump is so unbelievably attached that if you drive off, it yanks the pump off the freaking foundation. Come on, guys. Let's create a little valve up there, Mr. Uh, Exxon Mobil, that if it gets yanked super hard, there's like a little pop lock that pops off and it seals the seals the tank from being uh, spewing gas everywhere or something. Because just having these things drive off with the car blows my mind. It's 2021, right? But you'll see people in these really bad accidents, and it's totally their fault. Maybe it's just they're young, maybe it's they're old, maybe they just had a bad day and they pushed the gas instead of the brake, had it in drive instead of reverse. But these surveillance videos where the public rushes in, and you would think that somebody would lose their cool and you know yell at the driver, God damn it, you just ran over my wife or whatever. But it's amazing how people will be patient and realize the bigger picture, this person made a mistake. It's a horrible mistake. Hopefully no one's hurt. And they, you know, are you okay? And you'll they'll see them pulling these people out of the car and someone will get in the car and back it back out or whatever. And there's none of this point and finger thing, smacking somebody up. That's the way to do it. It's almost in our culture today, it's counterintuitive, right? Talk about rebuilding the world and making it a better place. That's some DNA I could use an injection of, you know? So realize you're in charge of your life, 100%. I'm going to say this over and over and over because I think we all need sort of a, a boost of this concept. We need to be reminded of this concept. It's just like having a personal trainer. Why do we have personal trainers? What do they do in the first week? They... Um, they interview you, find out your goals. They look at your nutrition. They give you better meal regimens. Then they teach you how to use all the machines in the gym. And then they don't go away. Now, of course, they're making some scratch with this time. But I got a buddy of mine who's a personal trainer. And he's there to go, 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 go. Where are you? You're late. You know, it's not the law that you got to show up to the gym. But they're there because they're trying to keep you on track. And they want a portfolio piece, right? Look at this person before. Look at this person after. So we need this at all intellectual levels as, as well as physical levels. What's funny about these type of episodes, and I know they don't appeal to everyone, but 
This was honestly the charter of this program. I thought that I never imagined in a million years it was episode 26 and then 165. I never thought I would cover the moon missions, to be honest. And that just happens to be a love of mine, and I think you guys dig it too. So in between those high-profile episodes, these are, I think, infinitely more valuable to you personally. I mean, I could have an episode. Let's say I made an eight-hour episode, and then I could cover every conspiracy this universe has ever given us in 10 minutes a pop. And so divide eight hours by 10 minutes, that's how many conspiracies I'm covering. And they're all, I got the drop, man. I got the, the book of all truth, right? And I'm just, well, the pyramids were built like this, and this was this, and dinosaurs never existed, and all this other stuff, right? Okay, so you're going to feel awesome with that episode. It'll probably get viewed a few times. But in the end, you got to go home, you got to look in that mirror, you got to get up, and you got to earn your money, your paper for, to pay the bills. Is it really helping you? I mean, is not really. It might clear out a little bit of stress inside your mind of like someone finally told the truth. But these episodes are way more powerful. I guarantee it. And if, you know, I think most of you realize these are therapy episodes for me too. Me reminding you of my own regiment that I have to remind myself of every chance I get. It helps me too. It's an echo. And then some of you leave those amazing comments, man. I mean, I'm just going to keep saying it. I just said an episode I recorded last night. Your comments have been utterly phenomenal lately, and I apologize for not liking them and replying to them. I'm not going to like them until I make sure I read them completely through. Most of them I have already, but I'm going to give you intelligent replies. So if you haven't been replied to, do not think for a split second I haven't seen your comment, because the second you hit a comment, my phone gets the message. This next uh, week, I'm going to have some time to invest in a bunch of different personal things because I've been working my butt off. But I got some paper, I'm going to pay some bills, and then it's back to the grind. So if you have not been to deepthoughtsradio.com, please understand there are, I think technically at this point, well over 600 episodes out there if you count up all the, the uh, special reports. If you are trying to view season one on this particular channel, you can find legacy links out there because I still get views on old episodes. I didn't block them. I just unlisted them because I remastered them on a different channel. But here's the cool thing. If you just go to the website, it doesn't matter. I link everything in there for you. And uh, so on that website, we've got obviously the link to this channel. You'll on YouTube. BitChute is the full backup. It's all 1080p, but it's working great. Some of the longer episodes are 420 because they're too big. They go over the two gig limit at BitChute, which is uncommunicated by the website. That's why a lot of people have problems uploading over there. All the podcasting you'd ever want to use. I use Podcast Addict on my Android phone. Fabulous app. Social media, it's, uh, I haven't done an update like this in a while, but Facebook <laughs> it routinely uses a, a bot to, um, to turn off the Facebook page, and then I petition, and then they turn it back on. So it's it's really about the 2020 thing at this point. Um, I usually approve almost every single comment up there. Where I see a lot of repetition, I'll just start saying, all right, we've already said this 20 times. And, you know, some folks post, like, the most controversial thing, and that's getting the the site turned off and turned on and turned off. And we've already said it, so I'm just starting to go, nah, we've already said this a bunch of times. So... I don't need to go through the hassle of losing my Facebook page because things are being repetitively posted up there. But apparently, if you live in Florida, you can now sue them. <laughs> so feel free, man. But we have uh, we have a little thing on Twitter, but it's a joke. Um, you know, just post the videos up there and make a few comments every once in a while. Not much, but I've got Minds.com. Gab is back up to date. 107 Daily finally figured out what their problem was. They have a link issue on their website. Their core kernel code doesn't link from one page to another on my browser, so you have to cut and paste every link you want to use into the browser up above or just right-click and say open new tab. Then it works. I don't know what those coders are thinking. But I got everything pretty well updated. Uh, in terms of, uh, what was it, that site... 
There's, anyway, there's a few up there that I turned off because they just don't work that well. But there is, like I said, an all-new remastered season one. They're a little shorter. They're more manicured for all the interruptions and stuff. We have a store with some cool apparel up there. You guys are sporadically buying. It's interesting. Like it won't, No one will buy something for a month, and someone comes in, and two different people will buy like a bunch of stuff. It's pretty funny. But we have a Season 6 shirt. We have the I Like UFO shirt. And we have the Deep Thoughts University apparel. And I'll tell you what, with the apparel, uh, one, I've knocked down all the prices way below what they say. I'm thinking about just doing a coupon for everybody. Patreon folks have the coupon. So I'm going to give them a larger one and give you a slightly smaller one. But the cool thing is, if you like this kind of conversation, wearing the apparel, I found just, no one knows who the hell I am. They'll go, what's that? You know, like the UFO one gets a lot of comments. Um, so, you know, that's a way to get conversation started. So you just like, well, don't worry about this. Let's have that conversation about things. And it just helps you have a little vehicle to start up the conversation. It's cool. But last but not least, the Patreons and the PayPal folks, thank you so much for your kind, kind donations every month. We got, uh, again, fireside chats over there. So it's more like kind of what's going on in my life and sort of the subatomic conversations about what these episodes are made out of. Um, any thought process I'm having about making new episodes will be up there. But you do get everything before everyone else. Um, sometimes you'll get them like several days before everybody else because I'm creating a package deal to get to release two at once. And when I release two at once, the reason why I do that is to, uh, one of them's more for me and the other one's for everybody else. So more of this type of cerebral stuff, which I think later in life, when the show is observed after I'm long gone, if that even happens, the episodes with the least views will be the ones that actually have the value the most in the future. So keep that in mind. But get in there and on the website and just look around. There's Everything's in a category list. So again, alien conversations are in their own area. NASA in their own, you know, spiritual, social, history, entertainment. So if you dig one, just find out what category it's in and go watch all the others. So anyhow, until the next episode, take care of yourself and someone else, and I'll see you in the next Deep Thoughts. Over and out.